Wow, we're so blessed to be here, blessed to be a part of this great church. I'm blessed to, to be able to pastor this great group of people. And God is good, and He's always good. We say it all the time. God is good, and all the time, amen. Amen. No matter what it looks like, God's still good. God's still working. And I just believe that, and I'm going to continue to believe that till I die in Jesus' name. That He's been that good. And that song that we sang, He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. When we're not so faithful, God's still faithful. And He loves us even when we've walked away, even when we've kind of veered away from the path. And He's constantly hunting us down and trying to get us back. Hey, hey, son, hey, daughter, I want you to come back. And He'll use people. He used people in the most odd ways to bring us a message to help us to get back on the path. Amen. And today I want to talk to you. We're, we're in a series called Miracles. And as, as uh, Danny said, we're doing a series called next week, which is called My Story. And it's going to be individual stories. I'm excited about that one. It's going to be very interesting. I'm going to kind of take a break from preaching for a little while. And they're going to get to share. I'll get to kind of meet, moder, moderate. And it's going to be interesting to hear how God's working in a lot of different people's lives. You think it's going to be cool? I'm excited about that. But today we're going to continue our series called Miracles. And what miracles, uh, really, we're talking about the miracles of Jesus. And we know that the miracles of Jesus, there's about 37, there was exactly 37 miracles in the New Testament, in the uh, Gospels, in the four accounts of the Gospels. And, of course, we know that that was just the ones that were recorded because Jesus did a whole lot more miracles than just those 37, even while the time he was on the earth for three and a, uh, doing his ministry for three and a half years. But today we're going to take a look at one miracle that's a very different kind of miracle, and I like this miracle very much because it really speaks to uh, about how we come to God. And it's the 14th miracle of the Bible of, of Jesus' ministry. And uh, I don't think that has any significance as far as the number goes. I don't know it does. It might have. But it's the 14th miracle that we read of in the Scripture. And what we find is it's a story about a woman that was desperately in need of healing in her body. And I just want to tell you from, this, from the get-go that this, this series is not just about looking at the history of the Bible and saying, well, that was good. That was 2,000 years ago, and, and that was a miracle that she received, and, and and it's not for me today. I just want you to know that I'm going to debunk that right now. That's not true at all. God wants to do miracles, and he's continually doing miracles in people's lives today. The problem is, is oftentimes we're not praying, we're not asking, and we're not, we're not looking for the miracle. We're not believing God for the miracle. We often go to other avenues or other things to kind of take up our time or when we're feeling down and we're feeling like there's a difficult situation in our life, which it takes difficult situations for God to do miracles. So if you're, how many, how many have ever prayed for a miracle? How many, when you prayed for a miracle, you got some trouble? Well, just know this, when you pray for a miracle, you're going to get trouble. Or you might actually be in trouble at the moment, and then you're praying for the miracle. So you're like, okay, I'm already in it, so I just need a miracle, right? So I'm going to talk about this today, because I think God wants to do some miracles in this house today. Like, like at the end of this service, I'm going to stand over here, I'm going to have some prayer partners, and we're going to just, anybody that can just, has the faith enough to step out and say, I need a miracle, Pastor. I need a miracle in my life, and I want you to pray for me for this. I just believe in that. Like, I believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the laying on of hands if somebody wants that. I'm not going to force anybody. I'm not going to do anything out of, out of disrespect. But if you want prayer, we believe in this. This house believes in prayer. We believe because I've seen God do miracles in my life time and time and time again. I just want to throw that out there. God's a God of miracles. He's in the miracle business. Amen. He's in the miracle business. So we're going to read this, and I'm going to kind of go through it. It's going to be a little lengthy at first, but we're going to jump in, and then I'm going to break it down. I'm going to try to keep my time down today, okay, and leave a little bit of time to pray at the end, okay? Mark 5, 21. It says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, which was actually the Sea of Galilee, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. And then one, of, then, then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came to him when he saw Jesus and he fell at his feet and he pleaded, verse 23, and he pleaded earnestly with him, my daughter is dying, 
Please come and put your hands upon her so that she can be healed and she can live. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd is following, and it was pressing around him. It was like a mob crowd. I mean, it was so many people, they, were, they could hardly breathe. It was just so tight, and it was so crowded. It's kind of like Gazooka Fair this year. It was so crowded, so tight, so many people, and it's hard to even breathe. And, and notice, it's this guy, Jairus' daughter. He's going to pray for Jairus' daughter who's sick. And, and, and this, this happens, like it's an interruption. There's a holy, a holy interruption. I want to tell you that there's never, there's never, to God, it's never an interruption. But it looks like in the story that it is an interruption because he's on his way from point A to point B to go to Jairus' house, right? And what happens? It says... So Jesus went with him, a large crowd followed him, pressed him all around, verse 25, and a woman was there. Uh, the woman interrupted Jesus. It was her, really her faith that interrupted Jesus, who had been subject to, for bleeding for, tw- uh, for 12 years. So this lady is hemorrhaging. It's probably a female problem that she's having. The Bible teaches, tells us, and that she's bleeding consistently and constantly, and her life is, a, is just, she's just sick and anemic and problems in her life. And, and health, and, and I will go into the details of that later, but uh, verse 26, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she got worse. Have you ever been there before? It seemed like things were getting worse and worse, and you've done everything in your power and in your strength. Maybe you went to the doctor, and the doctor gave you a worse diagnosis, and they did everything they could. Immediately, her, and I'm sorry, verse 27, when Jesus heard about, uh, when when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, verse 28, because she said, to herself, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. If I can just touch his clothes, I can be healed. Verse 29, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And at once Jesus realized that power had gone out of him to, from him and he turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes, which is kind of a ridiculous question if you think about it. The, the, the disciples are looking and see, to see, uh, you, you see the people are crowding against you, and the disciples answered, and you, you can't ask, you ask this, who touched me? Like, that's, that's kind of crazy, because everybody is touching you. It's impossible not to go through the crowd. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole story, the whole truth. And he said to her, verse 34, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be free from your suffering. Amen. I wonder if we could just pray right now and ask God's blessing over this word. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the power that's in your word. And God, today I pray, let your word speak to us today. Let it not be just words of human origin, but from the word of God. Let it have power to speak into our specific lives today. And God, I thank you for your anointing and your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. So what we have to understand about this story is that this woman had dealt, had been 12 years. It was a long, ongoing sickness that was not going away. Everything she tried, everything she did, she went to the doctors. The Bible says she spent all of her her money that she had on physicians. And they even, and, and what scholars even believe is these doctors were even trying new techniques to try to help this lady out because they couldn't help her. So they were, she was kind of like a guinea pig, just receiving all kinds of new treatments and, and, and situations. And she had to pay for every bit of it, even the, 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 the testing on her like that. And yet the, the scripture tells us that it got worse. It became more problematic in her life. And she just got weaker by the minute. If you've ever lost blood, have you ever, has anybody ever had like, had like a situation where you lost some blood? And it can actually cause you to get weak. It can cause you to become anemic. I remember one time I was playing basketball. This is kind of weird. And, and I, I, my finger went into somebody's mouth and my finger started bleeding. <laughs> and, 
and I, I looked at it. I go in the bathroom to fix the, the, the finger, and all of a sudden, I just fall out on the floor. I'm like, what's going on here? I don't know what that was exactly, but I was bleeding. I can't imagine bleeding for 12 years and the, the weakness that this lady must have experienced at that time in her life. Um, so what we find out from this, this text is that she suffered a great deal. The lady suffered much. She spent all that she had. And so what we see here, also what you have to understand is in that time, when, when, a, when a woman had this time of her life or at that time of the month, she would actually be considered unclean to everyone else. So she would have to spend seven days becoming, uh, getting over that, and then seven days she would be considered clean again, which is really crazy. Back in those days, they had some crazy religious laws. And this would actually mean that for 12 years, and that wasn't just she was unclean in a label, but she actually couldn't even go and be around people socially. So it actually affected her social life. It affected her financial life because she'd spent everything. It affected her family life because she couldn't even be around her family because she was unclean. She couldn't get out in the crowd and just walk around and touch anything because if she touched it, it became unclean. And if somebody else touched that same thing, it would be, she, they would be considered unclean. Do you get this picture here? It seemed like a hopeless situation for this lady. Everything seemed uh, bad in her life. It was one issue. The Bible calls this lady the woman with the issue of blood. But her one issue caused other issues and other issues. Have you ever noticed that when life happens, it happens in, in bunches? It's like little one thing causes another thing, and then it's another thing. And it's like this, that's what happened to her. She had issue after issue that seemed like her life was turning hopeless. But I want to tell you there's something that we need to remember is that we've got to turn our hopelessness towards Jesus. We've got to turn our hopelessness towards Jesus. Where do you turn when things look hopeless? Do you turn to the internet and, and turn to people that can, can encourage you on TED Talks or whatever it is? Where do you turn when things get hopeless in your life? I want to encourage you today, turn your life towards Jesus. Go to him with your needs. Did you know that prayer should never be a last resort? It should be a first response. That should be our first response. And we don't see this in the text, and I can't really read into it, but uh, she really came down to the point where it was. she tried everything else, but now she's trying Jesus. Okay, I don't want to be that person. I want to be the person that tries Jesus first. Now, sometimes we pray and we, we ask, but we're not really pursuing God with faith. There is a difference. Did you know that? There's a difference when you pursue God with your whole life. When you're living your life uh, for yourself and selfishly, sometimes that will take us away from hearing the voice of God and knowing God's will for your life. But God wants us to pursue him with faith. Everybody say, with faith. With faith. Activate your faith. Activate your faith and say, God, I just believe that there's hope in your presence, I believe that when I get in the presence of God, there's something supernatural that can happen when I begin to lift my hands and surrender my life to Jesus. Things can begin to take place that are miraculous, that are supernatural, that, are, that happen only by the presence of God. Amen. So here's the reality. When we turn to Jesus in our hopeless situation, Jesus becomes our source. We, we are acknowledging him. By simply praying, we are acknowledging Jesus to be our source. She spent all 12 years trying to get medical help, but then she went to Jesus. Amen. I hear people tell me this, and I, and I kind of smile. I, I don't really smile, but it's, it's funny when I hear it. But it says, you know, people say, unbelievers will sometimes say, you know, you know, religion is just a crutch. It's like it's just something that you lean on. Well, if that's the case... Uh, give me the wheelchair. I'll, Jesus is my wheelchair. Like, I need Jesus. I need Jesus to, to hold my hand every day. I need Jesus to help me every day. Come on, somebody. I need G Jesus is not just a, 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 a God in my life when I have problems, but I want him to be in my life all the time, and I want to depend on him. Come on. I want him to be the one that I go to in my time of crisis. I want to, be him, I want to go to him when I'm not in crisis. I want to go to God when things are good. Come on. And, and so this is what the world says, you know, uh, 
Jesus is my source. I'd like to tell those people, no, Jesus is my source. He's my strength. He's healed me so many times. He's healed my family when they were sick and they were dying in, a, in the hospital. I'm telling you, Jesus did that. I'm telling you. You know what? You can argue with people up to a certain point, but when they have an experience, you can't argue with an experience. You've come too late to argue with an experience. If I've experienced God's power in my life, you can talk about it and you can deny it and you can try to downplay it and say there's no such thing as miracles. But if I've experienced it and I prayed a prayer very specific and God answered, hey, that's between me and God. We know that there's a God. We know you've come too late to tell me that there's not a God. That there's, Come on. Somebody said amen. amen. See, some people, they, they say, people say, I, I don't go to church, but I'll go to yoga. Or I don't go to church or I'll do something else. And I'm not uh, going after yoga, but I'm just saying there's things that can't take the place of Jesus. There's things that cannot take the place of Jesus. We've got to have Jesus in our life. We've got to have Jesus every day, 24-7, because he is our source of hope. Come on, somebody. He is my hope. And here's what the scripture says. And when she heard about Jesus... When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak. Think about this. So the crowd is there. Now think about the fact that she was a, she was, she had this, this worry, I'm sure, in her mind that, you know, that she was unclean. And because she was unclean, the people knew she was unclean. Her family for sure knew it. There were probably doctors that knew she was unclean that may have been in the crowd on that day. There were other people that knew she was unclean, and she had to get past her fear of worrying about what other people thought about what she was going to do to pursue Jesus. And I just want to say this today. When you're in a culture like Lithuania, and I love Lithuania, but there's a lot of people that don't believe in Jesus and they think Jesus is, a, is, a, is something bad that you go to church. It's only because they haven't really experienced Jesus. They've just experienced religion. Come on. They've only experienced religion. But when you get a taste of Jesus and you experience what he can do in your life, you want to go to him. Come on. And I just, I just come to tell you that we've got, we cannot let what the fear of other people think stop us from reaching out and touching Jesus for ourself. Come on. I believe she heard it from the crowd. She heard it from others who received their miracle from Jesus. See, if, she was, if she was in her house and she was kind of locked up in her house, not able to get out, then obviously there must have been some people walking by because we, we know this from our last uh, uh, series that we've done, the last uh, installments, that most of the miracles happened around Capernaum. Capernaum was the city where Jesus headquartered out of. It was where the house of Peter was at. And so it was in Capernaum where this lady was in that area. And she saw the crowd coming and pressing through. And I'm sure she probably said, did you hear about those miracles that Jesus did? He just healed a blind man. And he could actually see. And he's jumping and running and, and excited about his miracle. Did you hear the other day that he, he healed somebody that was deaf that couldn't hear? And now the guy can hear. It's a miracle. 14 miracles happened, 13 miracles happened before this miracle. So we know, that's the ones we know recorded, there's probably many more. But we know that that got around. Because good. that kind of news is going to travel fast. Like that news is going to really, tell. and Jesus had a, vir a, follow, a following of thousands of people. So perhaps she heard it through the door, she may have been standing in the doorway of her house, and she hears people passing by, and they're talking about it, and it's just this buzz going on. People are following Jesus. It didn't matter how many people were there. They just wanted to get close to Jesus. Some of them had their own needs and needing of a miracle. And the Bible says when she got, she pressed her way. She, she got up behind the crowd, and she somehow got in that crowd, and she pressed in and the Bible says she had this thought, I just need to touch him, if I can just touch him. And, and all of that happened. You know how all that happened? When she got, when she heard that he could do miracles. Here's what I know about faith. Faith happens when you hear about what God can do. Then you start to believe, well, maybe God can do it for me too. Come on, I want somebody to leave today grabbing hold of this today and not just saying it's good for somebody else, but it's good for me. 
where I'm at today. Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Why is it important that we gather on Sundays and we worship? Why is it important that we dig deeper and go into Bible studies? Why is it important that we pray for one another? Because in this time, we're able to encourage one another. We're able to share testimonies and share what God is doing and the miracle power of God. And when that happens, we start to have faith that rises up. You might have a little faith, but by the time you're done, you have your faith starts to become more than little. It becomes medium-sized, then it becomes great faith, and you're like, man, I just believe God can do it for me. I love that kind of faith. I love it when people get that kind of faith because then God does miracles in their life, and they are able to use their faith to reach out and touch God. Come on. And here it goes in verse uh, Proverbs 29, verse 18 says this. So her faith painted a picture of what God could do. She started telling herself. She started convincing herself. She started creating a parameter for what she believed God could do. I don't know where she got that from. Maybe God put it in her heart. But she started saying, you know what? If I can just touch Jesus... Just, I don't even have to grab his arm, just touch the hem of his garment. If I can just get down there and touch that little tassel on the end of his garment, I just believe that I can be healed. I believe it. And she kept telling herself this over and over. If I can just touch him, if I can, she started kind of, have you ever done that to yourself where you just started talking to yourself? Let's, let's, you don't have to raise your hands. Um, you might think you're crazy. People might think you're crazy. Well, people think I'm crazy at my house because I sometimes preach to myself. Um, and so, so you start telling yourself, you know, I just believe that God can do this. I just believe that if I do this, God will do this. Let me tell you something. That's called faith. She had faith. She didn't even really know what it was. She just knew in her heart that she was started painting a picture. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, it says, without a vision... The people perish without a vision. God wants to give you a vision. He wants to put a vision, a picture in your heart that you will be able to see his hand and his power and his mercy working in your life. Come on. She got a mental picture of what Jesus could do. She was operating in faith. Her faith started to rise up. Her faith started to, that, that faith that was inside of her all along started becoming operational. And it, she started activating her faith. She started priming her faith to a point where now she's starting to believe what she's saying. And she was taking herself from, from unbelief into faith. Come on. She had fear all up on her because that fear was saying, you know what, if I go out there and I touch somebody... They're gonna, they're, they could potentially, they could have me stoned for touching them because I'm unclean. This was actually in the Levitical law. Like this was a real fear that she had to overcome. Come on. So here's the next point. Turn your fear into faith. Turn your fear into faith. See, faith says God is working for my good, but, faith, but fear says everything will turn out bad. Have you ever noticed that your fears can actually just play mind games with you? You can let fear get a hold of you so much that you start convincing yourself that something that's so small and minute that probably never will happen actually can become something so big in your mind and such a shadow in your mind that the little mouse looks like an elephant and now you just convince yourself and therefore you're paralyzed because of your fear. But this woman could have done that because she had been convinced that she was unclean. Because the religious group told her she was unclean and you are not to do anything. You're to sit there for seven days until after you get well. But she'd been sitting around for 12 years. Hello? I'm telling somebody today, you don't have to sit there. You need to just put your faith in God and say, God, I'm not going to hear, believe everything that everybody else is saying. I'm going to put my faith in God's word. He is the source of my strength. He is the source of all things in my life that is good. And I have hope in that. Come on. Someone said it like this. They used the acronyms fear, forget everything, and run. Like forget everything and run. Just run. 
But what about forget everything and rise? Why don't we rise up? Why don't we turn our faith, our fear into faith and say, God, I'm not going to run. I'm going to rise up and I'm going to believe you for something that you can do in my life. I'm going to get a picture of it. Here's another scripture in Hebrews 11.6. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The, did you know that faith pleases God like nothing else in your life? When you operate in faith, when you take, did you know that every one of you have been given a measure of faith? God said, I've, I'm giving all of you a measure of faith. That's a portion of faith. But it's up to you what you do with your faith. Like you can make your faith multiply. You can, you can increase your faith by the way that you live your life and how much you live your life. By being obedient to God's word, by walking it out and saying, God, I'm not going to let what everybody else tells me stop me from, from reaching for the things that you have for my life. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he is the rewarder, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God rewards you when you seek him by faith. Come on, somebody. I wish somebody would get this. God rewards those who earnestly seek him by faith. When you get passionate and you get to a place in your life where you're desperate and you say, God, I am desperately in need of God who can bring healing in my life. He can bring healing to my relationships. He can bring healing to my emotions. He can bring healing to my self-esteem. He can bring healing to everything every part of my life, I want you to know that's where God's calling us to. Because when we start to seek Him and say, God, I'm believing, the first way that we seek God to be able to find God is we do it by declaring. She said it like this in verse 28. If I can just touch His clothes, I will be healed. If I can just touch. It was almost a little... Um, a little uncertainty at the beginning when she said it. It's if, you know, if I can just do this. If, have you ever felt that way before? Like if I can just get enough strength, I believe I can do this. If I, and this is what she started telling herself because there was a whole lot of things against her at this point. But I want to tell you, don't become a victim. Become victorious in your mindset. Don't let this victim mentality hold you down and keep you down. But say, God, I'm putting my faith in the one that's the victor who conquered death, hell, and the grave. I've got power in Jesus' name. Somebody, I've got power in Jesus' name. We talked about that last week. And so we have power to overcome. As she keeps saying it, she starts building her confidence enough to go to, into the crowd. She came behind the crowd. She touched the hem of his garment. And what are you telling yourself about your situation? I think this is so critical about our faith. What you are telling yourself, if you're going to say, well, man, I'm a, I've always been a loser. I've never, my parents are, it did this all their life, and I just can't get out of that, break that curse. I, I want to tell you that you don't have to say that. Because if you keep saying that, you're going to go right where you're saying. Like you're going to, that's, it starts with what you say. It doesn't end with what, it starts there. What are you saying about your life? Because what you're saying really does have an impact on your future, on your destiny. Here's the word that the Bible says that she touched the hem of his garment. The, just the edge of his garment. That word touch there means to seize it's not simply to just touch like this. It literally had more deeper meaning. It meant, uh, the word was hapatame, the Greek word, and it meant to seize, to grasp. She, gr she grasped it, not necessarily in a physical way, but there was something in her, her desperation, in her desperate spirit that said, I'm going to grasp it. I've got something that I'm going after, and I'm not going to let go of it. I'm going to reach my destination. Come on, somebody. This is the spirit of faith that's operating in this lady. She had so much against her, but yet she was going against everything that was coming against her, and she knew that God's power was greater. If I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. If I can just grab hold of that and seize the moment. Come on, somebody needs to seize the moment. That word there means to grasp or seize. She seized the moment. Amen. She said, I will be healed. 
I will be completely restored. I will be whole. I will be delivered. I will, salvation will come to me. I will be healed. That word salvation encompasses healing as well. In verse 29, it says, And immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt her, in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Oh, hallelujah. She felt in her body that she was free. Did you know sometimes it just starts, like, I don't know if you've ever had a healing and you've ever experienced this before. I remember one time I was in Belarus and we were missionaries working in, in the city of Mogilov and we were just doing a work for God and it was a dark place. It was hard. It was difficult. And I remember getting sick. My wife and I got sick. Uh, we were living in the Chernobyl radiation zone there in Mogilov. It was seven years after the uh, Chernobyl radiation disaster. And there was, we were always getting some kind of sickness that would come and, and get on us, and we, we didn't know what was happening, but we were just there. to We were there for the, for the adventure, man. We were like, we're going to do whatever it takes. God's going to use us, and we're going to reach people, and we're going we're gonna to share the gospel with people. We didn't really think about the consequences. But I'm telling you, I saw some of the most miracles I ever saw in my life during that time. And I'll never forget this. I was, I was sick laying in the bed, and I'm not going to go into the details of my sickness. But I was literally in pain. I was laying in the bed, and I couldn't get up. I didn't want to get up. It felt bad. And I'm not going to tell you the details. I'll spare you the details. And I remember as I was sitting there, I was thinking, God, I've been praying for everybody else and praying for God to heal them and save them. And here I am laying in the bed sick and I can't even hardly get out of the bed and walk. And you know what I did? I just said, God, help me. God, I need you. I don't know what. And it's like the Lord spoke to me. I just felt this in my heart. He said, I want you to get up and I want you to praise me. I want you to praise me right now. Now, this was weird. I know it is. I, it's like it's, it was weird for me at the moment. And my wife's in the other room and I'm in the bed feeling it, you know, feeling this pain and all this that's happening. And I literally, I'll never forget it, I got up out of the bed very carefully, and when I got up and I was going to pick up my Bible and read it and just kind of think on what God had done in my life in the past, it was like the Lord said, now I want you to, sh I want you to worship me and I want you to jump. Jump? The Bible actually talks about jumping for joy. It talks about praising God in the jump. Did you know that? It talks about praising God with the raising of hands and waving the hands. It says praising God with clapping of hands. It's all throughout the Bible, different ways in which you can praise God. Well, I, I'm standing there, I'm thinking, man, if I jump, it's not going to feel good, really bad, because it was not going to be nice. And I literally just said, okay, God, I'll do it. And I just started to jump a little bit, just a little bit. And I started to praise God. I said, God, thank you for my healing. Thank you for my, and I, a little bit more, I got a little more brave, and I just started jumping. And as I started to jump, I felt in my body instant healing, instant healing, like it was gone. The sickness that I was experienced was gone. Come on. I'm not, this is not, this is not just an uh, uh, overblown story. This is what happened. And my wife is in the other room thinking, what's going on with my husband? He is going crazy. Like what's, he's on there yelling, praising God, thanking God. And I'm, I'm like, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. And I just want somebody to know today, God wants us to activate our faith. And when you first start out praising God, some of you need to just learn how to raise your hands in church. Some of you need to just learn how to sing a little bit. It might start out a little bit. It's like, man, just a little bit. Oh, but I, I'm not, that's, not my, that's not in my nature. Well, guess what? When you become a full-blown believer, there's a lot of things that you'll do that is not in your nature. Come on. Did you know when I first started out preaching, I was the most bashful, shy little boy, and I couldn't hardly say, put four words together without stuttering. And you know what? Jesus helped me, and Jesus will help you too. But he wants you to start to declare it with your lips. He wants you to start speaking it with your mouth. He wants you to start saying, if I can just touch the hem of his, uh, if, 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 if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. Come on, just a little bit of faith and then a little bit more faith and a little bit more faith and God can do great things in your life. I'm not telling you how that's going to look because I'm not God, but I can tell you faith works and God is pleased by your faith. 
And faith is not just saying from a distance, God, I believe that you exist and that's good. But faith is saying, I'm going to activate my faith in the situation that I'm in today. And I'm going to declare healing and I'm going to declare deliverance. And I'm going to declare that God is great in my life. Come on. I'm telling you, when we start to do this, we're going to start to see the miracles of God and the hand of God working in our life. It's something like this. You know, um, the Bible says immediately, immediately her bleeding stopped. I can relate to that. Like God did that immediately for me when I started to praise him and thank him, when I became obedient to him. Sometimes God will ask you to do things that seem ridiculous, totally crazy, because that's how God works. Because you know what he wants? He doesn't want you to get any credit. He wants him to get all the credit, and he wants it to be all about him, not about you and me. Come on. So that's why God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Because I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes preaching is foolishness. It feels foolish to the preacher, but it really feels foolish to those you're preaching to that don't believe. Hello? And God's choosing that to reach people so that they can know the word of God and experience. There's power in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Everybody said in Jesus' name. And the Bible says that when she t he touched her, when she touched him, the hem of his garment, it says, as the crowd was pressing around, Jesus looked around to see who had done it. And the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and she was trembling. This is in verse 32. She was, verse 32 and verse 33. She was trembling. You know why she was trembling? Because she kind of probably thought like this. You know, I believe that God can do it, and maybe I can just blend in with the crowd. You ever, you ever gone to church and you thought, eh, I'll just go blend in with the crowd. I'll sit in the back, chill out, just get a little blessing. But you know what? If you're going to take it to the next level in your faith, you can't blend in. There's going to be a point where God's going to say, hey, you want your miracle? you got to come out. Hello? And what she said to her, Jesus pointed her out in the crowd. He was headed to another destination. He points her out and says, who touched me? The disciples are like, Master, everybody's touching you. No, 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 no. Who touched me? This was not a touch. This was the touch of faith. This was her faith touching God's power. And when your faith touches God's power, great things can happen in your life. I want somebody to know that today. Somebody that's dealing with physical ailments or you're dealing with situations in your life that are beyond your control and they feel hopeless. There is power in the touch of faith. When your faith reaches and touches God, it'll feel weird. It'll feel crazy. But God will hear and he'll stop what he's doing. You say, somebody touched me. He's looking around at all the hundreds and thousands, the thousands of people that are around him. He stops and looks and this woman has to step out. She has to step out because Jesus took the time to acknowledge that someone touched her. Him. And she steps out trembling. Why was she trembling? Because she knew that if, if, if God didn't do the work, she could be stoned. She could be stoned because she was unclean and she touched somebody. She didn't just touch Jesus. She touched everybody else around. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. Jesus literally did nothing but declare those words over her. And she already said in her spirit, I know that I've been healed. She felt, and Jesus said, I felt virtue flow out of me to you. Virtue is dunamis power. It's, word, it's the word for explosive miracle power. It, explosive miracle power went from Jesus to this lady because of her faith. Come on. And today I want to tell somebody, it's never too late. It's never too late. Twelve years of pain and suffering and, and emotional distress and physical heat suffering, financial struggle, all of the issues that led to all the other issues. But God loves you and he sees you. And he'll stop if you'll have faith, if you'll believe, if you'll reach out, if you'll step out of the crowd and say, God, I just I'm crazy enough to believe it. In Jesus' name.
Can we all stand today? We're going to pray, and I'm going to just pray a prayer over us right now. And then if anybody else has a specific prayer need, I'm just going to stand over to the side here. I'm going to ask Veet and some others to come from our team. We're going to pray. And I'm telling you, I'm, I believe that Jesus can touch you. It's not the touch of any man, any person. It's God's touch. But God wants faith on your part because it was her faith that healed her. Her faith in Jesus that brought the healing. She set the parameters, but then she had to obey Jesus and come out. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you today. We thank you so much for your grace, your power, your love. And Lord, we know that you are here in this house today. You're still doing miracles. You love us so much that you send your word to speak to us, to build our faith, to encourage us right where we are. Some of us are hearing this word and we're feeling like God's speaking directly to us. That's because he is speaking to you. And today I pray right now, let the word of God empower us to be able to activate faith and to walk out and step out and say, God, I believe, Jesus. I believe that you're going to do a work in my life. Lord, I can, if I can just touch the hem of your garment, I'll be made whole. Lord, I just believe if I step out, I can receive healing. Just if I can get a prayer prayed over me, I believe that you can bring healing in my life. And Lord, I know I can't do it, but you can do it, God. And Lord, I'm putting my faith where it belongs in Jesus Christ, the source of all things, the source of all power, the source of all deliverance, the source of all healing. In Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I give my life to you today. Maybe you're here today for the first time. Have you never surrendered to Jesus? I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you, Jesus. Lord, I'm like this woman that felt hopeless at times and Lord I need you Jesus or maybe you're in a different stage of life and you just have kind of veered away from the path Lord I surrender my life to you Jesus Lord I believe that you are the savior of the world and that you died on the cross and you rose on the third day and today I surrender my life Lord forgive me of my sins create in me a clean heart and fill me with your spirit I receive it I receive salvation and I want I ask you to be the Lord of my life. From this day forward, I will never be the same. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And somebody said, in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you to keep moving in your journey. Don't stop. Don't just stay there and get stagnant, but say, I'm going to move into Bible study. I'm going to move into making my next step in baptism. Whatever it is God's saying, do it. Because that's where God can do the miracles in your life. Today, we're going to give you an opportunity to pray. If there's anybody that wants to step out, there's, I don't care how long the line is, we're going to pray for people today. In fact, we're going to anoint with oil. I brought my oil bottle today. In James, it says, anointing them with oil in the name of Jesus that they might be saved. The Bible says, if we pray the prayer of faith, they shall be healed. And I believe in that. I can't do it, but Jesus can. And we're going to believe that. This oil is symbolic of the oil of the Spirit. It's the blessing of God. And I believe that God wants to anoint us. We're just going to put a little dab. If you want it, if you don't, we'll just pray. But we can dab a little bit on your forehead and pray. And I pray that that people pray over my life and over our family many times. And God heals. So we're going to do that in Jesus' name. So God bless you.